you so much, uh, Amrita, and thank you, Sukhi. Thank you, Khaki Labs, for uh, having me over for this, uh, what I hope will be a talk which is of interest to uh, the participants who have joined here. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of you are uh, regulars for Khaki Tours, so it's a it's a, probably a new uh, audience for me as well. So thank you so much for this. Um, my talk today, it is part of, uh, actually it's the research that I did as uh, from um, for my book, which is The Broken Script. And uh, this is, uh, it. about a quarter of the book is about the revolt of 1857. The book itself is about is the history of Delhi uh, in the first half of the 19th century, culminating in the revolt. So um, today I thought for this talk, I will focus on the revolt in Delhi. Now uh, the talk, the title of the talk has this word micro history. And there's a reason for that. The idea is that it's, it's the history of one event. And that also that one event in this one particular city, what happens? And why, when we look at history from this, uh, from this close up, such a detailed close uh, look at a particular event about history, it tells us uh, things about how people interact, about how uh, in the past people have interacted. It tells us about society in that period um, and all sorts of interesting things like that. So um, that is what I'm going to talk about, about the revolt in Delhi in 1857. Now, uh, I can understand that a lot of people may not uh, even, I mean, we are all aware of 1857, uh, the fact that it was a big uh, rebellion against British rule and uprising against British rule that engulfed large parts of India. Um, and it went on really till uh, very for for a year or so year or more in fact large parts of the country were in uh, 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 in rebellion in this uprising uh, but for those who particularly are not that familiar with what happened in delhi i will give a, a short uh, sort of uh, 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 description of the events a short narrative of the basic events that happened which give you a little frame within which I'm going to be talking about the more specific uh, points about the revolt, the lesser known uh, features and elements which people often don't look at. So on the 10th of May, 1857, some soldiers in Merat revolted against their British officials. Now the British, this Contournment in Merat was of the Bengal army of the British East India Company. The Bengal army, uh, the soldiers were all Indians, mostly. The soldiers were all Indians. They were recruited from um, mostly parts of the Ganga Yamuna Doab. And uh, they, they had various grievances which had slowly been accumulating. Part of the grievances were about their terms of service. The British East India Company's armies had been fighting a large number of wars all over. For instance, the Anglo-Afghan wars, the, uh, before that, of course, the Maratha wars had happened, but more recently, the Afghan war, the, uh, the war in the Punjab, all of these things, uh, they had been, the army had been under constant uh, conditions of war. Uh, their service conditions were not great. They were not, their pay was not great. Their living conditions were not great. And uh, as the British, for instance, uh, uh, annexed Punjab, they had also decided that, okay, now if you serve in the Punjab, you will not get your, uh, shall we say, your over, you know, outside uh, external uh, deputation allowance or whatever it was. So they had a lot of these kind of grievances. They, of course, any soldier is also a part of the wider society which he comes from. So the fact that these were all soldiers who came from peasant families in the Doab, they had the kind of grievances which peasants had. Their family, you know, uh, their tenures over their land was a little uh, 
uh, in insecure, uh, revenue rates had been going up, uh, rents had been going up, all those kind of grievances that the peasantry had, the common soldier also had that kind of grievance. But the most um, immediate triggering factor was the Enfield rifle and the so-called greased cartridge question. Now, this was a newly introduced weapon, the Enfield rifle, which had a, a cartridge, which uh, it had a cover of, which was of paper, which was rumored to be greased with animal fat, and that fat being uh, uh, fat from the uh, from uh, pigs and from cattle. And the idea was that both Hindus and Muslims would object to this very strongly on religious grounds, particularly as this cover had to be torn open by with your mouth. So this was the immediate cause of the revolt because the soldiers had refused to accept this cartridge and hence the rifle. Uh, but the British were equally and very insensitively, the army officers were uh, de determined that they would be they would have to use this. So that becomes the proximate cause. And as I said, on the 10th of May, 1857, the soldiers revolt. And uh, interestingly, they revolt, they kill uh, uh, some of their officers, uh, their uh, families of the officers. And what do they do? They immediately head for Delhi. There was a reason behind that. Um, and I won't go into that very much at this point, but uh, you know, obviously this forms the background of the book as well, but uh, the Mughal emperor uh, all this while, Delhi of course had been the capital of the Mughals for many uh, centuries, uh, particularly after Shah Jahan moved the capital to Delhi, Delhi had been the capital. And uh, even though the Mughal empire had declined, the Mughal emperor was still seen by large numbers of people in India as the legitimate ruler of the land. And this was not true only of the common people, it was true of many of the, uh, the princes of India as well. So for instance, a lot of the Maratha chieftains, the Rajput princes, they all in their coinage also carried the name of the Mughal emperor. So when these soldiers uh, decide that they are going to overthrow British rule, what do they have as an alternative in front of them? These are, they're in Meerut. Meerut is not very far from Delhi. And they decided that, okay, we are now going to go to the Mughal emperor and put, restore him to the... That, that is a sort of an amorphous feeling. That is, that's an instinctive first feeling that they get. And they uh, immediately head towards Delhi. Early in the morning of the next day, 11th of May, they crossed the river, they used, there was a bridge of boats and uh, they arrive in the city. This is the month of Ramzan and Delhi was uh, almost 50% uh, Muslim at that point. So there were a lot of people who were fasting. Um, the city get, got going very early in the morning as well in those days, it's a summer's day. So things used to get going very early. People used to, uh, were, were working in the courts, etc. when these soldiers came across. And what they do is they go straight to the fort under the, uh, there it was a window on which, at which uh, Bahadur Shah used to overlook the river every morning and see people used to, you, when you, they used to come and have their bath in the river, they used to after that come and uh, sometimes just uh, do what they call darshan. They used to look at the emperor, often they used to speak to him also. So this used to happen and the soldiers appeared below this window and they told Bahadur Shah, we have come to, we have overthrown our uh, leaders, our officers, we have killed our officers, we are now here and we, we want you to lead us in this revolt of ours. And Bahadur Shah was actually quite horrified at this because he said that, look, what you have done is very dangerous because the British will now come and they will kill you. And if I give you shelter, they will kill me also. But they were very insistent. Anyhow, he did not let them in through that gate. They eventually found their way in, in another, from another gate. And their entry into the city sets off really the revolt in Delhi as well. What happens is that first of all, Delhi was also, it was not a big, canton, big cantonment like Meerut, but it still had a sizable 
a military presence there. And as I said, all the common soldiers were Indian. And all of these soldiers slowly, uh, or rather not slowly, very quickly, actually rapidly joined their uh, mutinous uh, colleagues, right? They became, uh, uh, they also uh, decided that they will uh, not obey their officers, they will kill their officers, and they will join the rebellion. So they uh, very quickly joined the revolt. There are other people who joined the revolt also, pro most prominently as these uh, soldiers were coming into Delhi, there was a peasant population which used to live outside the walls of the city. That peasant population often uh, in large numbers joined them and entered the city with them. Also when they entered the city, they uh, released the prisoners from the jails. So those prisoners also joined them. A lot of the common people of the city joined them. And what happens immediately is a good deal of violence. And this violence, of course, primarily is directed against the British. Uh, there is a military population. There are military officers, their families. There is the civilian population. Because at this time, Delhi was ruled by the British. The British had been administering the city, even though the Mughal emperor lived here, uh, but he was no more than, he was not even a puppet. He was just a pensioner of the British who used to live in the Red Fort. So these, uh, they, they want to, the soldiers want to eliminate all this uh, resist. This is where the resistance is going to come from, right? The British. So they want to, uh, so they killed a large number of them, but some of them managed to escape uh, to Karnal and all. But that is not part of our story. There's a lot of, has been written on that. Um, also, uh, some of the people who they were targeting were people who were believed to be sympathetic to the British. And uh, this included people who were, say, for instance, Indians, but who were Christians. The idea was that they might have loyalties towards the British. There were, of course, the non-government British also. There were uh, what we now call the Anglo-Indian community, which was of a mixed race. So all of these people were seen as targets of attack. Now, so, so what happens is that all this violence is perpetrated. In the coming weeks, uh, more and more soldiers start coming to Delhi because there is, the revolt has broken out all over. Uh, slowly, the rebellion spreads. The news of the revolt spreads and uh, soldiers in cantonments all over North India start re revolting, Central India, and they, they revolt and many of them converge on Delhi. So uh, one thing one must, uh, uh, it's, it's quite difficult for us to imagine. This was a city which inside the walls had a population of about 150,000, one and a half lakhs. And at the height of the revolt, by in August, mid-August, about 80,000 soldiers had converged on it. So you can imagine that a city which is only 150,000, 80,000 soldiers converge on it. Anyhow, so you have um, this initial violence that is happening. Many of the targets of attack Particularly, as I said, the soldiers are very focused in that sense that they want to eliminate their enemies. But some of the common people, who are the people, think what are the things they attack? They attack what they see as symbols of colonial rule. They attack the Delhi College. The Delhi College was a Western style college in Delhi, which was set up by the government. They attack that, they loot its uh, laboratories, its library, all of that. They attack the bank. They attack the bank. They kill the manager and his family. A lot of people loot the, all the money that is there in the bank. Some of them are, uh, you know, very wantonly destroying government property of all kinds. So things like, you know, one eyewitness uh, reported that he saw a wrestler, a pehelwan, uh, attacking a, or rather breaking down a lamp post. If the British had put these oil lamps in the streets. Huh? So even that is seen as government property and it is attacked. So all this was happening. But within this, uh, uh, 
this disorder that it has. There are some people who were also attacking private property of a different sort. Shops, houses of rich people. And these are many, very often these are the laboring poor of the city. And some of them are the uh, criminal classes also. Remember, a lot of people have been released from the jails. So they start to attack these. Uh, in fact, what they do is they tell the soldiers. So if they know that this is a rich merchant, they will tell the soldiers that there is some, um, uh, there is a, there's a European that is hiding in this house. Please go and catch him. So the soldiers will go and they will attack the house and try and, try and search it. In the middle, all these people will go in and they'll quickly loot the ho house and the shop or whatever it is also. So they, there was a lot of people who were taking advantage, opportunistic advantage of the revolt to uh, loot their neighbors, their richer neighbors. So this is also happening, this private property being looted and not only of Europeans, but of Indians also on the pretext that they are hiding uh, Europeans. So. With all this happening, the Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah, decides that, first of all, the soldiers come and say, we are, we are, uh, you know, we, 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 uh, whether or not you like it, you are our leader now. So they put a lot of pressure on him. And he says, I am, uh, okay, I will become your leader. And one of the things that occurs to him also is that if I don't take leadership, if I don't try and bring some order to the city, there's a breakdown of law and order. This kind of oppression that is happening now, it cannot go on. So in fact, uh, Bahadur Shah, the emperor, he takes charge. He um, tries to put bring some law and order into the situation. He makes proclamations. He goes out on a in a procession, trying to tell people that don't worry, please keep your shops open. There will be no looting. He tells the soldiers to, uh, you know, calm people down, not to uh, allow them to loot and all. So he begins to exercise some amount of uh, control over the situation. What is, I think one of the things that we must remember also is that while all this looting and killing, et cetera, is going on, there are a lot of townspeople who are against this, particularly against the violence. And uh, some of these British people also were sheltered by Indians simply because they, there were people who felt that un, particularly unarmed women and children and all should not be killed. So for instance, we have this uh, story of a tailor, Nathu. And Nathu, the tailor, actually hides a lot of, uh, hides a family and several others in his uh, house. And in fact, his house is burnt after that when they are discovered. So at great risk to themselves, people hide them. There is another story of one Malvi Abdul Qadir who uh, sheltered, who found a British lady lying in the street wounded. Huh? She was injured and he brought her home and his family looked after her for, for a long time, uh, actually, until she was rescued by the British when they came in. So there are these many, many stories of this sort of people uh, on principle saying that uh, violence against uh, women and children is wrong, whatever may you may think of British rule. So all that is also happening. So there are different views of different people in the city. Anyhow, uh, what happens now? So this is a kind of overall view of the revolt of the climate that is there in the city at the time. And within a month of the outbreak of the revolt, the British come back with some amount of reinforcements and they try to take the city, recapture it. It's not so easy because by now it, there are a lot of soldiers in Delhi who are in the city, so it's not easy. But what they do is they position themselves on, a, on what we in Delhi call the ridge. It is a raised piece of ground, which is just outside the city walls. They occupy the ridge and for the next three months, they arrive in the beginning of June. And uh, in for the next three months, you have a sort of, it's called the siege of Delhi, but it's not really a siege because the city was never completely besieged, but it's a kind of a standoff. The British are on the ridge, the Indians are in the city, and there are these skirmishes that happen between the two. Uh, and there is a stalemate for three months. And it is only in the middle of September that the British get the upper hand and they 
retake the city. So as I said, it's this period between these four, three months or four months that we are talking about. So one of the things that is really not been talked very about very much, some mention has been made of it, but is of interest, is that the administration in Delhi was being run. We talk about how Bahadur Shah was restored as emperor, but it is much more complex than that. It is not just Bahadur Shah. It is a new kind of administration, an administration which, of course, gives a lot of place to the military because this is a you know, it's a military situation, it's a warlike situation, but there are democratic principles in that because the administration, it is the form of the government that is made. It's called a court of administration. It's called a court of administration. It has 10 members, six military and four civilian. And these military members are two from the artillery, two from the cavalry, two from the infantry regiments. They are supposed to be uh, elected by the people of these, uh, uh, the soldiers of these regiments. The civilians are supposed to be elected from among the people. Now, this was never effectively put into place. I mean, remember, this is a period we are talking about. There is no concept of election, uh, what things we take for granted these days, those that is before those times. But the idea is there that there should be representation from different uh, categories of people. So this court of administration is set up. It has a precedent. It has a vice president. Uh, and of course, there is the military command also, which is separate. And a commander in chief is elected. At first, for a while, it was a Mughal prince called uh, Mirza Mughal. But later, it is a uh, army subedar uh, Bakht Khan, who comes to Delhi from Bareilly, and he becomes the commander in chief. So there is this administrative system, which is much beyond the old Mughal rule. It is not that. It is completely different because it has this court of administration. Now, what are the tasks at hand before this administration? One very important thing is fighting the war because you have to win the war against the British. You have to defeat the British in Delhi and also around. You have to dislodge them from the ridge. You have to defeat them. And this was not an easy task. One very important thing was resources were short. For instance, even simple things like gunpowder was in short supply because right at the beginning of the revolt on the very first day, the magazine where a lot of gunpowder was stored had been blown up by the British themselves. And uh, even later when they collected gunpowder, there used to be accidents. There was one major accident in which a lot of gunpowder was blown up. So therefore there was shortage of supplies. There was shortage of all sorts of equipment, you know, even to house the soldiers. You know, as I said, the city only had a population of 150,000. And if you have 80,000 more coming and staying here, then it's kind of difficult. That number used to keep fluctuating because some of the soldiers used to go off to fight in other places also. So, but at the peak, it was 80,000. So fighting the uh, British with a lack of supplies, also the leadership was inexperienced. And there was a very good reason for why it was inexperienced. In the British armies, while the soldiers used to be all Indians, the Indians were never promoted to senior official positions. The highest that an Indian could rise in that British art, Indian army was to the rank of Subedar. Now that does not give you, uh, it's, the, it's the higher officialdom, the generals. These are the people who, have that greater vision of how a, a war has to be fought, how an arm, army has to be organized. So these people don't have that uh, kind of experience which is required for running a war. But nevertheless, they uh, fight very bravely. The British, when they first came in June, they thought that they will capture the city very quickly, but it took them three months to actually do that. So it is testament to how brave these soldiers were. The other task in front of the administration is maintaining law and order. And as I said, Bahadur Shah had taken a important role in that, in trying to pacify people, 
in trying to tell, for instance, tradesmen, people who uh, were who had shops with grains and all that, that you know you must keep your shop open uh, and supply these soldiers, etc. All those kind of things. But it was a difficult task because what had happened was the countryside was in revolt, and uh, there were a lot of disruption because some areas were. Uh, under Indian troops, some areas were under British control, some areas, I'm talking about outside the city, the countryside, and uh, with different kinds of control. And it was not easy for trade to function. I mean, you know, in a city like Delhi, all the, even the food grains, they had to come from outside. So uh, transportation, travel, the supply of food grains, supply of other essentials, it was difficult to arrange. It was difficult for the traders even to manage their finances in this kind of, uh, uh, in this kind of um, uh, situation of war and disorder in the countryside. So that was a problem. This also uh, collecting revenues from the countryside. Every government needs to collect taxes. Otherwise, how will it run its administration to collect taxes from the surrounding countryside to send out people? Remember, the administration was being run by the British. And suddenly that all that leadership of the British administration is removed. So what you have left now is this court of administration, which is trying to run this administration in the city, but also the surrounding towns, the surrounding villages trying to collect taxes. It was not an easy task to do it in these very trying circumstances. So all of that is the task which is in front of the administration. Now, what, why are they doing it? And, you know, I, I have talked about the kind of grievances that are there in the city. Uh, it is not easy for them. Uh, why are they doing it? There is an ideology behind them. Of course, they have grievances. They have grievances, uh, but what is their worldview? A lot of the rhetoric of the revolt is about religion. The rhetoric which is against the use of the Enfield rifle, for instance. So that soldiers, for instance, immediately say, we are fighting to protect our religion. That is why we have risen up. We have risen up to protect our religion. But as I said, that if you look a little bit more under the surface, there are many, many grievances that the soldiers themselves have. And in this appeal to religion, uh, there we must also remember that there is a feeling that while you appeal to religion, it should be an inclusive kind of appeal. So Bahadur Shah, for instance, was very annoyed when some Muslims in the city put up this kind of banner of jihad in the mosque. And he says, what is this jihad? jihad. It's not, this is not jihad. This is, a, uh, you are protecting your religion, but it's not a religious war. You are fighting against the British uh, because they are evil, but uh, it's not a religious war. So please don't put it that. So he had it removed. Also, there was this conscious effort to make sure that the Hindu and Muslim population, whether it is of the city or it is of the soldiers who have come from outside and they are also a mixed group, that that should not come in the way. There should not be any division on religious lines. And therefore, for instance, Bahadur Shah uh, announced that at the upcoming Eid, nobody would be allowed to uh, sacrifice cattle for Eid, so that he, so at the same time, there is this rhetoric that we have to, uh, we are fighting to save our religion, but it's a more inclusive uh, kind of approach to that, that, uh, you know, everybody has to save their religion. It's not just about the religion of the Muslims or the religion of the Hindus. So one of the ideologues of the revolt actually is the new editor of the Urdu newspaper, the Delhi Urdu Akbar. And that person, he's, he's, his name is Mohammed Bakr. And Mohammed Bakr actually, uh, in his through his newspaper, is a very strong ideologue of the revolt. He managed, he uh, seeks to, for instance, rally the people behind the cause. 
He tells them why they should fight, why it is worth fighting, how uh, he tries to improve their morale also to say that they will win. And one of the things he says is that you must understand that, you know, God is behind us. God is behind us because remember when uh, Ram with a very small army could defeat Ravan, you know, go to his uh, country and defeat him. And he does this only because he has the power, uh, because he has right with him. So we also, even though we are small, we managed to, you know, a few soldiers managed to do this big thing of upturning the British administration. It's because God is with us. So remember, this is a time before you have concrete ideas of nationalism. These are uh, ideas of nationalism are yet to develop strongly. So this appeal to religion actually is a way of rallying people. And Mohammed Bakr goes beyond religion also. He talks about a lot of things and some of the things which are, uh, are in, you know, a budding understanding of what colonial rule is. He talks, of course, of racial prejudice. And this was something that all Indians used to experience quite, you know, obviously. So he talks about how, uh, you know, people, how the British have called uh, Indians black people and have, uh, you know, have dismissed them like that and have treated them badly on purely racial terms. But he also says that there is, there is something that is different about colonial rule. He is one of the first people who actually draws attention to what came to be known later and developed uh, in detail by Dada Bhai Noroji, which is known as the drain of wealth theory, because he says, Mohammed Bakar says that people, uh, the British have collected taxes, they have a lot of that money they have spent in giving their own people uh, large salaries in India, and that money which has been collected has in salaries or whatever, it gets transferred to Britain. It is not spent in India. If it were being spent in India, it would cause economic development in India. He doesn't call it economic development, but he says fares jo hai, the benefits of this money it does not spread in this country because it goes out of the country. And he is now understanding the economic basis of colonialism and uh, raising his voice against that, saying that is why we need to overthrow the British. But now while, and uh, he says that the Mughals were different in this manner because Mughals did not transfer the wealth of the country outside the country or whatever they spent was spent in India and all that. He also says that they described, uh, you know, so, so all these things are reasons to be behind uh, Mughal rule. But what is happening under it? And what I said was earlier in another context that this is not just about restoring Mughal rule. There are ideas that there are these democratic principles, the court of administration. It's a hint that if the British finally are thrown out, it may not be plain and simple Mughal rule that is uh, brought back. It is a different kind of system that will be there. And there, you, th these, this is something that has not been talked about very much, but in Delhi particularly, you feel that there is a group of people who are looking for a very different, at a very different worldview. As I had said, there are a lot of the laboring poor, for instance, who have indulged in looting in this period. Now, these people, these, these are lower classes, these are lower castes also, and often they were used to be kept out of the British Indian armies also. British Indian armies were usually upper caste. And these lower castes are now arming themselves. They, because they get this money from the looting, they have armed themselves, they had bought arms. They form themselves into separate ar a separate army. And that is an army which in the common parlance, they get referred to as Ghazis. Ghazi literally means a warrior. So they form a Ghazi army of their own, which is apart from the uh, mutinous soldiers that had come. And these, they assert themselves vis-a-vis -vis the Mughal emperor, vis-a-vis -vis the main army, they also, uh, so they start asking for more rights. And in fact, the newspapers often report that the poor have stopped doing their usual uh, menial jobs. They stopped cleaning the streets. Uh, they stopped filling water, you know, those menial tasks. So there is a class uh, 
uh, uprising that is kind of happening here, also a class divide that is happening. And uh, this is something that even at some level, the Bahadur Shah Zafar acknowledges that this is happening and some amount of uh, uh, allowances will have to be made for that. So one thing that he says is there's this letter which gets sent out, an order that is sent by the Kotwal, the police chief, to all the thanadars, all the heads of the police stations. And, the, and he sends out this letter, this order saying that so far you have been uh, referring to the Mughal, the, of, to the emperor as Hazrat Jahapana Salamat, your exalted majesty. So instead of Hazrat Jahapana Salamat, now you will please refer in all your correspondence to the emperor as Garib Parvar Salamat, the protector of the poor. So there is this different worldview that the new order when it comes will be an order which will be more equitable which will be more equitable. It will uh, have not just upper castes and upper class people, it will have representation and include the voices of uh, other sections of society. Now, these are very progressive, very startling new ideas that are coming up, but there is also then the pushback. So you have the elite of the city, whether it is the service elite, whether it is the uh, intellectual elite, whether it is the uh, merchant class, they all push back against this. Ultimately, they withdraw their support from the revolt. They are not wholeheartedly behind it. They don't support it. Um, they don't support it with money as much as they can resist. And they also do not, uh, you know, there are also, there's a spy network that is operating in the city. So they also become in some ways uh, contributors to intelligence that is then sent out to the British, which helps the British eventually reconquer the city. The city is reconquered and the British, when they come in, don't discriminate between who were their friends, who were not their friends, who supported the revolt, who did not support the revolt. The city is destroyed. And that brings me to the end of what happens after 1857. There is, uh, the city is destroyed in many ways. I won't go into the descriptions of that. Uh, there is an intellectual, Delhi was a very important center of Urdu poetry, of course. And many of the poets wrote a number of poems about the revolt of 1857 in a genre which is known as sheher e ashob or sheher ashob it literally means destroyed city and these this poetry is very interesting because much of this poetry tells us what the elite and these poets are from that elite class they are of course the intellectual elite but they are also the socially uh, upper classes you know these are the intellect, uh, educated elite classes of the city and what they think of what happened in the revolt so i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to end by reciting some of this poetry and uh, telling us uh, telling you about uh, what 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 this tells us about the revolt how did they see the revolt so one very important po poet was somebody called Sadurdin Azurda, and he was he was also a judicial officer in Delhi before the revolt. When the revolt happened, he kept a very low profile. Bahadur Shah asked him to be, you know become a, again become a judge and do his judicial duties, but he made one bahana or the other, and he kept away from the fort. So he writes this and it's Urdu. I will speak uh, talk about I will recite it in Urdu and then I will give a translation. It says, Afat is sheher pe kile ki badolat aai, waha ke amal se dilli ki bhi shamat aai, roze maud se pehle hi kayamat aai, kale merat se kya aai ke afat aai. So what he says is, misfortune befell the city due to the fort. He lays this at the uh, feet of the, at the door of the Mughal royal family, which, you know, supported the revolt. It was the evil deeds of that place that invited punishment on Delhi. Doomsday dawned before the appointed day when the black men came from Meerut, misfortune arrived. This black men, Kale, Kale Kaun hai? It is the, of course, the, it was always used for Indians in opposition to the white British, but it was also in this case being used as Kale as in 
you know, the soldiers were of the peasant uh, population and peasant populations in pre-modern societies have tended to, because they work out in the open in the fields, et cetera, they tend to be of darker complexions than city folk who are, uh, you know, working indoors. So there was this whole uh, kind of uh, class thing happening over there also. So uh, then, and of course, the whole idea that Delhi was actually, that these are outsiders who have done this to Delhi. That also is something that is very evident in the kind of poetry that they're writing. Their complaint is that this is uh, people from outside who have done this. Tamam shehron ki pushto panahati Delhi, gunhagar hui be gunati Delhi. Of all cities, Delhi was the protector and asylum. It was held guilty, though it was innocent. So it is like distancing the people of Delhi from these outsiders who are doing all this gadar, right? Uh, then there was, again, uh, the, another very famous poet, Mirza Khan Dag, and he writes about, again, this whole idea of these are these peasants who are coming from outside and are uh, have taken over our city and have brought this destruction upon us. He says, Jagha jagha the zamindar dar ki surat Everywhere they were peasants like death, they were irrepressible like a fever. Each rest rustic had the face of evil, you know. So the idea that these are different from us, these are peasant people, they are we are shahris, we are very sophisticated and you know all this and we would never have done this but it's these people who have come and done this of course there was also a recognition of the fact that it was the you know the less privileged in the city who were also had not only joined these rebels but they had then upturned the social order so there is that upturning of the social order that we see reflected in the poetry also. There was one poet, Muhammad uh, Zahur, who writes, Sada tanur jhonke tha jo ladka nan bai ka, bhara hai iske sar mein ab to sauda bir zai ka, karoli band ke dikle hai hat ab ladka kasai ka, ameeron ke barabar baithe hai farzand dai ka. The street cook's lad who did nothing but stoke the fire, now he fancies himself a Mirza. A Mirza is a nobleman. Hmm? The son of the butcher goes around wearing a hunting knife. The son of the midwife sits on level with noblemen. So there is this whole idea that, you know, uh, people who did, uh, the less privileged are now seeking equality with the noble people. There was, of course, ultimately also this lament for the city which had been and which was destroyed. So, uh, I will end with this particular line from which I actually took the title of my book also. It says, uh, it's written by Kadir Baksh Sabir and it says, Bas ke bedaad se tute hai makane dehli, ho rakam khate shikasta se bayane dehli. So unjustly have the buildings been raised in Delhi because the British came and after the revolt, many of the buildings, like for instance, 90% or more of the buildings in the Red Fort were demolished. Uh, also many other buildings. So, so unjustly have the buildings been raised in Delhi. It is fitting to inscribe in the Shikasta script. Shikasta is a broken script, the account of Delhi. So that is what happened during the revolt. How various people in Delhi saw the revolt differently, what they, their aims were, what their uh, ideas behind rebellion were, what were the kind of ideologies that were slowly coming up. And uh, many of these, I think these are aspects of the revolt that uh, people don't often realize. The revolt, like many other aspects of this period in Delhi's history, has often been romanticized as simply uh, a tragedy. And it is a tragedy, uh, particularly what happens after the British come in. But there are these many different subtle nuances of um, the politics behind the revolt, which also I think are significant and we need to look at them. So I will come to an end here and I would be happy to take any um, questions. So Suki, up to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sopna. That was such a beautiful, you rightly said uh, the nuances that you know we all don't read in history books and uh, or in any any of the other books and literally like peeling uh, you know pe you know layers of the onion and telling us a little bit more of what happened uh, uh, then obviously all of us don't have access to or 
uh, the knowledge of the literature and the languages. So thank you very much for that. Um, there are uh, questions and I'm going to share them with you. Uh, uh, first one is mine. You know, uh, the terminology itself has come under so much debate on whether it was the mutiny or should it be called the first war of independence. So I wanted to know your thoughts on that. Yeah. So the British, of course, uh, dismissed it as a mutiny, that this is only uh, the soldiers which are mutinying against, which is an illegal act, right? Of course, it was much, much more than a mutiny. There are many different, they're not just soldiers, there are many different sections of the population which rose up against British rule. It was very widespread. Uh, as I said, peasant populations, other populations rise up against British rule. So it's much more than a mutiny. First war of independence, when you say that, the idea that this is rule from which we as a whole country need independence, that those ideas are a little bit in the future. I think we should not read back uh, that perception of this as the first war of independence happen, happens later when the national movement grows. So it is like looking back retrospectively at, attaching this term to it. It's not so much, a, you know, in those days, I think we very wrongly sometimes judge people of that period. How did you allow the British to come and conquer you? I mean, how did you allow so and so to come? You know, it is much more complex than that. People in those days did not think of national boundaries the way we think now. So did not think that this is an outsider. This is an, you know, people who are, the idea is that people conquer places by force of arms. That was what conquest all through history up to that point had been. You know, you have some rulers, tomorrow there'll be some other rulers. They will come from, they may come from elsewhere. They may, you know, there are no elections happening, right? These are conquests that are happening. This is change of regime, which happens sometimes through uh, force of arms. Now, whether you judge that regime on the basis, you don't judge that regime on the basis of these are outsiders and insiders because there are no national boundaries at that point. So you judge, they are judging the regime on the basis of how well it has performed. So they are saying that these are the British, they have done this, 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 which we disagree with. And therefore we are upturning this regime. They don't think of it in terms of independence. They're thinking in terms of upturning a regime which has, not, which has disappointed their uh, aspirations, uh, not looked after their needs. So, Therefore, I use a more neutral term, the revolt. Other people have used uprising. It is a rejection of British rule. Absolutely. You talked that, you, you told us that Bahadur Shah was very reluctant in his, uh, but how, how powerful was he? Uh, you know, what was his force strength like? His main strength was a sort of moral authority. People respected the Mughal emperor. And this is, goes beyond, uh, of course, Bahadur Shah Zafar was personally quite well liked in the city. People had a soft spot for him personally, but much more than that, it was the Mughal name. The idea that Mughals were, had been, were the legitimate rulers of Hindustan. That was an idea which was surprisingly strong, even though the Mughal empire had been in decline for a long time. So a lot of people, for instance, used to even imbue the, body of the Mughal emperor as having some sort of a spiritual aura. The idea that people used to go for bathing in the Jamuna and after that do darshan of the Mughal emperor. The idea that he had a spiritual aura. A lot of people came to him and asked him to be their spiritual guide, their peer. Huh? So all that idea was there that he has this, you know, he can be our savior. Uh, so that was there. So that was his, his moral authority, shall we say, was strong. But uh, of course, uh, you know, as I said, it was all tempered by many other factors that were also coming in. The expectations were different now, that he will protect the poor, for instance, you know, uh, that, that was definitely there. Adil would like to know uh, whether there were any Anglo-Indians among the Sepoys who revolted, and uh, was there any mistrust between them and the other uh, Sepoys? Um, I don't have, I mean, Again, in the Delhi case, I don't see to any, I haven't come across any strong uh, indications of that, of there being any of that category. But um, I think there, there is anecdotal evidence here and there, but I wouldn't like to comment on that because I just don't know enough 
and there is nothing in Delhi as such uh, about that. He also wants to know uh, what was the impact of the revolt on Mirza Ghalib and his poetry, and what about his life after the revolt? Mirza Ghalib, of course, uh, uh, he he kept himself like a lot of the intellectual elite. He kind of tried to keep a low profile. He went to the, he was the emperor's ustad at that point. You know, he was, uh, he used to correct uh, Bahadur Shah's verse. Now, Bahadur Shah had very little time for poetry during the months of the revolt. So, Mirza Ghalib went now and then in the court. He was said to have written a, 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 a sort of a, a sikka, which is a inscription, you know, uh, in praise of the revolt and Bahadur Shah's leadership of that and all that. Uh, when So he was kind of like keeping a low profile, seeing how things turn out. But after the revolt, like all the other people, he was also under suspicion by the British. The British suspended, he used to get a hereditary pension um, from the British. So that was suspended. He was under suspicion for a long time. Uh, he was one of the few people who did not flee the city when the British entered it because he lived in a street where there were uh, uh, the uh, Patiala Sarka, the soldiers were guarding that street. Patiala was at that time, and you know, the Patiala street was with the British. So they kind of protected that street for various reasons, which I won't go into just now. But Mirza Ghalib was one of the few people who was there in the city at this point when the British came and perpetrate a huge amount of violence on their own. And he wrote this so-called diary of the revolt. It's not so much a diary as an account of the, these days of the revolt and after the revolt. It's called Dastambu. So he writes about it. He has in one or two verses also talked about the revolt, particularly in verses which he wrote to letters to his friends. His letters are a great uh, uh, source of information about you know, what happened after the revolt particularly. And he, uh, of course, he suffered because of all this. He suffered because of the dissolving of the Mughal court itself. Um, like all the others, he was not in favor of the revolt. He criticized it. So um, therefore not very different from them. I think you've already answered Anil's question where he talks that your your stories are inclined to the British version and you call it a rebellion, but I think you've already answered that. Uh, Adil says that Bahadur Shah Zafar himself was a, a more, uh, you know, more a poet than an emperor in power. So why uh, did the British think that he was behind the revolt? Was it just to put a blame on someone and show uh, that if someone else were to do it again, they'll sort of, you know, this, the action that they'll do in prison and exile, etc. You are quite right. The Mughal Emperor had the Mughal Empire was long gone. There was no um, so as I said, he had this spiritual or, and other you know aura of power around him, which some people, which many people still believed in at one level, and that actually led to the soldiers convening in Delhi. They're converging on Delhi when the revolts broke out in various parts of the country, but. Uh, what the British really thought was, or what they, their, their official line was, that this was some sort of a Muslim conspiracy led by Bahadur Shah Zafar, right? Now, it can't have been that they really believed it. They didn't, because they quite well understood, particularly even from the reports that were coming in from Delhi itself, that in fact, Bahadur Shah was in two minds about this. And the fact that it was the soldiers who had taken the lead, and many of the soldiers were actually not Muslim at all, right? They were not Muslims. So uh, that also was wrong. And the city people were also divided. It was not seen as by neither the emperor, nor the soldiers, nor the people of the city, or any other place, was it seen as a religious war under Muhammad and the Bahadur Shah against the British. So the British decided to take this line for a very important reason. They decided that they would make Bahadur Shah a sort of a leader of a conspiracy so that they could once and for all get rid of Bahadur Shah and the Mughal Empire, uh, Emperor and the Mughal royal family altogether. They had a trial, they tried him in a court, 
uh, in a military court. He was uh, sentenced guilty of all the crimes that he had supposed to have done. He was exiled. And that was the end of the Mughal Empire, of the what the remnants of the Mughal Empire were. And that was very seen as very important for the British because they, 1857, had opened their eyes to the fact that there could be people all over the country who are willing to throw themselves into a rebellion under the name of the Mughal Emperor. You can't afford to have this guy around anymore. You have to get rid of him. So that is why this happened. Vipanshu wants to know if you know what happened to the Salatin during and after the revolt. The Salatin, uh, the wider Mughal uh, family, you know, here again, there are the main Mughal princes, the Shahzadas who are the sons and grandsons of the Mughal emperor. They have a lot of stake in the revolt because they know that, you know, already the British had decided that the Mughal emperor, after Bahadur Shah Zafar, they would not recognize another Mughal emperor. And these people would be uh, pensioned off and not have the sort of privileges that they were still enjoying to some extent. So the Mughal princes were wholeheartedly behind the rebellion because that was their last ditch uh, attempt to revive the Mughal power in whatever way. Hmm? So they were the Salatin, which are the more distant relations of the Mughal emperor, we don't hear a very we don't hear very much about them during this revolt. But they uh, so they they must have also kind of gone along. Some of them went along with the violence that was happening, etc. Um, they suffered after the revolt was suppressed because many of the princes who had been active, of course, were killed out were killed. And many of them were, uh, the Salatin were exiled to distant places, uh, not, uh, not Rangoon so much, uh, uh, Karachi, etc. They were exiled uh, to distant places. Some of them were, uh, they were all thrown out of the Red Fort. Uh, some of them were given uh, uh, some pensions, etc. Many of the women had been the targets of sexual violence once the British recaptured the city. Unfortunately, these things happen when wars happen. Women are a category who suffers very harshly. So uh, many of them, uh, then they were left without any means of subsistence. Their families, their menfolk had been killed or exiled. Uh, many of them took to sex work to support themselves. So it was, it was a tragedy for uh, many of the members of the royal family who were uh, distantly or closely related to the Mughal emperor. So now Chatterjee says that she read a wonderful book, Tears of the Begums, Big Ahmad by Kiyasu by Bajaj uh, Hussain Nizami, which was translated by Rana Sarkhi. We have had the pleasure of being uh, here as well. Uh, so Nali also says that it was a privilege to listen to this amazing talk, and she's reading your book, Chandan Chow. Uh, she loved reading Thank you so much. Uh, Ragbet Suman says that I read that there was a planning that all sections of the country should rise at the same time. But Mangal Pandey and the regiment that he was in started the revolt earlier. That created confusion and different sections started revolting at different points in time and that helped British manage the situation. Let's know if you think that's true. Uh, yes, of course it's true. But you know, as you know, how do you, how do you coordinate everybody rising up at the same time? I mean, in this day of instant information through social media and all, you, I can, I, I challenge you to organize a thousand people uh, to come together in one place. You know, how do how do people all uh, how to persuade people all to rise up at the same time? As I said, you know, this is not a war of independence that is happening. These are very very complex events that are happening. Very complex forces are at play over here. So. Uh, I think we can't blame them or fault them. Yes, of course, this is the way things happen. Chris says it's an amazing and informative session and very true that only in retrospect can you call it a term as the war of independence, it was more a rebellion, so he agrees with you. Uh, Shorindu Ray says, uh, thank you very much for, enlighten for the enlightening discourse. And he has a question. I note from the plaque at the Mutiny Memorial that the toll on either side was almost equal, 1982 Europeans and 1632 native. Uh, does this reckoning include the Indians who were killed by the European soldiers or, or was it a battle, you know, was it aligned differently? 
No, no, those are numbers which were killed on the British side. Uh, because you must remember the British armies which finally reconquered Delhi also were manned to a, quite an extent by Indian soldiers. There are Gurkhas, there are uh, the armies from Punjab. So there are many which have been recruited. As I said, you know, we should not like think of, today we are thinking of them as Indians and not Indians. But in those days, that Indian category is not really there, right? So there, these are different, uh, but retrospectively, we call them Indians. But, you know, when you when they, when the British are calling them Indians, they are saying these are not Brits, they are not English. But they're all the numbers that you see on the mutiny memorial are all uh, of, um, of those who fought on the British side. Indian casualties were actually larger. The Indian casualties were larger. As I said, the Indian army, its main strength was its numbers. On the Indian side, there were numbers and they were, uh, they were, they were, they had a very harsh toll and that toll has not really ever been satisfactorily, I think, even enumerated. So we cannot make those kind of guesses, I think, of how many were killed. Chris says that destiny decided that the rebels will lose after their brutal inhumanity of the BB gun massacres, the Sage of Kanpur. Sorry, what? Sage of Kanpur. He, talk, he talks about their brutal inhumanity of the BB gun massacres. Oh, yeah, of course there are. You know, obviously there are all sorts of, there's all sorts of violence perpetrated, right? But also you must must remember that there's violence perpetrated on both sides. There are uh, uh, British uh, 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 instances of great violence as well, in not only during 1857 or the subsession of 1857, but in many other parts of their conquest of India and the suppression of various rebellions and revolts, etc. What you must remember is that the stories that were written were written by um, people who were in some ways connected to the British memorialization of the revolt. And they tended to, of course, uh, dra dramatize these instances of violence. And there was also these instances of violence were used for a sort of a rhetoric to motivate in, British soldiers who were working to suppress the revolt. It is, you know, the way in which the Indian side is using the greased cartridge issue to motivate Indians to say that you have to save your religion because these people are out to destroy your religion. Whereas there are many, many complex factors involved there. So this, it was felt that this idea that there is this, uh, you know, innocent people have been killed and women have been violated. And in fact, there was an inquiry to say how many women had been violated and it was found that actually women were killed, British women were killed, but they were invariably not raped at all. But anyway, that is beside the point. There was a lot of innocent uh, uh, killing, but the point is that these were used as rhetorical uh, tools as well. And uh, there's violence on both sides, yeah. Gaurav wants to know about what happened to the Mughal princes of the Puni Darwaza. Uh, well, the Puni Darwaza, there are a couple of uh, sons of Bahadur Shah Zafar, one uh, grandson. They were being escorted uh, by Hodgson, who uh, Hodgson had sort of worked as a kind of a spy master during the uh, revolt and he, during the standoff between the British and the people of, and the soldiers in Delhi, and he had negotiated the surrender of Bahadur Shah as well. And he was escorting these princes to uh, the city where he suddenly stopped and you know, a crowd had gathered because people had seen that these princes were going and they wanted to see what was happening. You know, the, how people gathered to see something interesting, different happening. And he then later said that, you know, these people were there and he just drew his gun and he uh, shouted to this assembled crowd that, you know, these are the people who are responsible for innocent lives being lost. And he very dramatically then shot them dead. 
and um, they were shot dead and their bodies were brought. So that's why it's called Kuri Darwaza actually. That it's a particular gate from the 16th century which stands in the middle of a road uh, now, but um, it, they were killed there and their bodies were brought to the city and they were kind of um, exposed uh, to public view. I think you already answered uh, this question. Manan wants to know, uh, uh, he's complimenting you saying all your talks and heritage walks are exquisite and you leave him with goosebumps and uh, in wonderment. Uh, he's got your most recent book, Shah Jahanabad, Mapping the City. It's an eye-opening book in the most obviously meticulous attempts to document uh, Shahana, uh, Shah Jahanabad. So thank you for this. <laughs> Lena wants to know, uh, always wondered if the events described by Emma in Twilight in Delhi are true, talking about 14 September 1857, when he describes the arrival of British Army to Jama Masjid to capture and the people inside coming out uh, to fight from the Northern Gate. And is there something that you can tell us about it? There was, I don't remember exactly what Ahmed Ali writes in Twilight of Delhi. I mean, yeah. so, uh, but I can tell you about exactly what happened. Um, Jama Masjid was this British entered the city on 14th of September, uh, 1857. They broke down Kashmiri Gate and entered the city. It took them one week to recapture the city, even though most of the soldiers by then had left. The soldiers decided that if Delhi falls, we will not surrender. We will go off elsewhere and we will continue our fight. So they had left the city, but a lot of the city people uh, kind of rallied around and uh, tried to defend the city. So it took them one week to actually conquer the city. And one of the last places to go was the Jama Masjid because they, Jama Masjid, they barricaded themselves there and they fought from there. And in fact, the British troop, which went down from the Northern gate, tried to enter that lane, you know, uh, it, you know, from the, it, it, it's called Bazar Gulia. So if they tried to enter from there, the gate opened, uh, gun, guns were directed at them, these cannons, and they were let loose. So they retreated very quickly. So yes, this was one of the last bastions of Delhi to fall, the Jama Masjid. Uh, Goro would like to know more about the Salimgar Fort part of Lal Kila and how it changed hands during 1857. Uh, I think it's not a so much a question of changing hands. Salimgarh was a sort of a, um, for this period, at least it was an adjunct to the emperor's control over the Red Fort. Salimgarh was also under Mughal control. Salimgarh was at the northern end so of the fort, and it was under constant and direct fire from the British position on the ridge. And then when they came closer, uh, there is an area outside the walls, uh, Kudsiya Bagh. So from there, they used to uh, carry out this heavy bombardment of the city and uh, Salimgar really took the worst of that bombardment. So even if you see today, uh, most the only buildings that survived, you know, there's this one masjid, which is in a really terrible condition because most of it was destroyed in the shelling. So uh, Salimgar, uh, <laughs> as I said, suffered that. Thank you so much. Uh, there are a lot of compliments that have come through both in the chat and in the personal messages to us. It's been uh, so delightful, like I said, to uh, see the feeling of the uh, layers and the nuances that you've shared with us. Thank you for joining us on the Saturday evening, uh, Swapna, and also thank you to all of the audience for uh, joining us on Saturday evening and see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm so grateful for all of you. Thank you, Khaki Labs, for organizing this and all these you lovely people who have joined in and uh, said such kind things about my talk. Thank you.